Biosphere Institute of the Bow Valley. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, uh, the Biosphere Institute is a local charity based here in town. And our goal is to tackle what we believe are the two biggest challenges in the Bow Valley today. One of which is human wildlife coexistence. So you may have heard about WildSmart program. And the other is climate change. And we manage our climate change programming through Bow Valley Shift. Uh, where we're trying to empower local residents to reduce their energy use, uh, take active transportation, uh, reduce their water use, uh, and reduce their waste. So first of all, I'd like to start this evening by saying a really big thank you to everyone uh, who participated in this project uh, so far in 2019. Um, so with funding from Energy Efficiency Alberta uh, and the Town of Camel, the Biosphere Institute spent six months in 2019 really trying to engage the local community and find out what is it that people really want to learn about energy efficiency and how do they want to learn it. Um, so we analyzed the feedback and with help of local specialists, some of which you're going to hear from tonight, um, we developed this workshop series uh, based on what we learned and what we figured was the best ways to educate people. Um, so tonight is the second workshop. Um, you missed the residential clean, uh, sorry, residential renewable energy solutions. Uh, if you want to catch up on that, uh, we are hosting a video of the event on our YouTube channel, uh, so you can watch it anytime. And in the future, we'll be hosting it on our website once we upload it with lots of awesome resources to support the education uh, that was given on that evening. And the same will be done tonight. Um, so tonight, uh, we're going to have a couple of presentations. Uh, one is from a local passive house designer, and the second is from a fellow state, and they're going to talk about um, passive ways to heat and cool your home and heating and cooling technologies, uh, hopefully that work really well here in the Bow Valley. Um, and following that, we're going to have a QA and a session uh, with a couple of local contractors and our developers, uh, sorry, our speakers, um, and I ask that you just hold your questions until the end. Uh, so that we can get a really good conversation going during the Q&A. Um, so I wanted to just tell you about our next workshop, which will be our final residential workshop, which will be on March 26th, same time, same place. Um, and we're going to be talking about energy efficiency financing solutions. So it's the big question. How, how much do these things cost and how on earth am I going to pay for it? Uh, so we always say the first step in that is having an energy audit. So we're going to have an energy auditor come and talk you through the process. Uh, let you know how much these things might cost um, and also a couple of presenters coming from Energy Efficiency Alberta to talk about the Clean Energy Improvement Program um, and some local financing opportunities for renewable energy and efficient uh, retrofits. Uh, we'll also be here to tell you about other opportunities um, for financing solutions. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, tonight's agenda uh, we're going to start off uh, with Raphael Spinner from Heat Success Design Build, and he's going to talk to you about Passive House. Uh, so if you could just welcome him to the stage. Yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, tonight to the workshop. Let's get started. My name is Raphael Spinner uh, with HSS Design Build. Um, yeah, a bit about my, my, my past. Uh, I grew up in Switzerland and uh, yeah, I might look young, but I actually have 16 years experience in construction. Um, so yeah, so my background is a, a timber frame and, and um, a specialist in heavy timber construction as well as passive house design. Um, with HSS Design Build, we offer passive house design uh, and consulting services, as well as building envelope uh, consulting and uh, design build for residential and commercial projects here in the Bow Valley. Um, why do we need to build more energy efficient? Um, well, we all know that energy or that greenhouse gas emissions are increasing and that. Uh, yeah, the climate is, is turning for the worse, um, if you want if you want to acknowledge it or not. Um, and the important point is that buildings account for about 
about 50% of energy use. Um, so it's just a lot of energy use if you think about it. 50% goes, goes towards uh, the, the, the construction. Um, so what does, what does the government do? So the, the feds have announced they want to reduce the emissions and increase the energy efficiency. And also they want to make all the, the buildings, the federal buildings, uh, net zero carbon by 2020. And to speed things up, they, they, they said they want to have an energy efficiency uh, model building code by 2022. So it's not that far away. Um, it might take a little longer, but um, anyhow, so the, the main goal is to have a net zero uh, ready building code by 2030. And so if you look a little bit closer, just at the energy use um, in this graph, so about 50 to 60%, depending on the source you're looking at, goes towards space heating. Um, so in the rest, in the other 40%, we don't have much room to, to save energy. We do, maybe in the appliances, we get, can get uh, energy efficient appliances, Energide, Anistar, um, yeah, a few things to, to conserve energy is just use what you need, right? Turn your light off when you don't need it. Um, uh, get efficient light bulbs and, and so on. But really the majority, the 60% um, of, of the heating is on the space heating. So wouldn't it be great if we could reduce this number significantly? So, which leads me to the next thing. Um, Passive House was... Um, founded in the late 90s, and it was founded by two doctors in, uh, in Germany and, and Denmark, I believe. And they really wanted, they looked at it exactly the same thing that we're looking at right now, and, and they said, what if we could reduce the space heating? And they actually found a way to reduce space heating uh, up to 75 to 90 percent, which is a significant sum. And so the goals are um, that you have a maximum energy use for, for your house, which is 15 kilowatts at a square meter per year for the heating and cooling demand. And then the second is that the air changes there are, are really uh, rigorous um, looked at that they're only 0 0.6. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've looked at air changes here and, you know, current building uh, practices and they may be two to three times or two, two to three air changes an hour. So it's a, it's a significant change. So how do we achieve this uh, target? Um, so we have to do a, a calculation and energy modeling and that's based on the passive house planning package. Um, so it's basically a big um, Excel sheet that models uh, your building, and it's um, it has to go back and forth with the design because so what you put in that uh, PHPP is is the location, the orientation, the windows, the size, the quality, the building envelope, uh, the solar heat gain, the internal heat gain, um, and then you look at thermal bridge calculations as well, and you really make a lot of detailed construction. So it's really that the planning before construction starts. Figuring out the details is really important um, and a necessity to achieve the passive house standards. Um, so let's look at the five principles. Passive house is basically based on these five principles. Uh, yeah, so which are superior insulation, uh, windows and doors, uh, ventilation with HRV, air tightness, and thermal bridge free construction. Let's look at these items in a bit more detail. Uh, the insulation. Well, living in Camaro, it should, it's, I think it makes sense to, uh, yeah, to put on a lot of insulation. Everyone is wearing a puffy when it's minus 30, but our buildings don't. So why not? Probably because it's just not common. But uh, in a passive house, so the, the insulation values that are standard or range from minimum R38 to R56, sometimes even more. Um, it really depends on the climate and all the other factors. Um, the graph on the side here shows um, basically the 
one wall built up up right over there with the TGIs. So, um, what, yeah, what this shows is uh, so the first layer. Do you have a pointer here? Anyhow, so the first layer between one, the one is basically the installation layer, and then the number two is actually the airtight layer in this. So you see this black curve. This black curve is the relative humidity, and I put it at 50%, which is usual, but it's probably less here in Fenway just because it's so dry. But anyhow, what this shows is because the, the vapor barrier, or it's not a vapor barrier, but basically your airtight layer is here in the middle, and so the humidity increases then decreases and, and uh, goes to the exterior. Um, so in the passive house, we can put insulation on the warm side of the vapor barrier, which is, yeah, it's generally not done this way, but it, it is possible. Um, it has to be proven with a, with a calculation. Um, yeah, so Various layers are really good, and then on the outside, it's it's always great to have a thermal, a continuous insulation on the outside, which is on the outside of the studs. Uh, you can see that well in those samples I brought over as well, um, just because they they reduce the thermal uh, bridges and and increase the the, the energy efficiency. Um, the other thing that's also important is uh, the insulation value. Um, so when you buy insulation here, it always shows the relative uh, insulation value. Um, so, the, the, so the relative is only from the insulation material. The effective is from the whole buildup, because you always have wood in there or steel um, material that don't insulate that well. So it's, it's very important to always consider the effective insulation value. Uh, the second things are windows and doors. Um, High performance windows and, and doors are really important because uh, they are the weakest point in the building envelope. So it, it's important to pay extra attention to this. Um, while originally all the passive house windows came from Europe, there is a few producers in Canada now as well that produce passive house windows. And so the difference is um, uh, just better seals. They usually have three seals they're triple pane, uh, the window frames are insulated, and, and also we'd like to over-insulate the window frames on the bottom in the detail, and it, you should also see that in one of the samples. If you over-insulate the window frames and you set the window in the middle of this construction, um, it reduces the, the cold spots, um, basically in the corner, where there is, right here, originally there is always where the the, the water um, um, the water would evaporate, so you would it would create mold. So if you set the window more into the middle, you reduce the risks significantly. Uh, the third um, important point is heating with uh, with an HRV ventilation system, and because we have such great insulation in in our passive house. And, and such great windows, we actually don't need to heat uh, very much um, because we retain the heat that we already have. Um, so, so what we also consider in, in the heating load cal calculations is the internal heat gain from sources as, as body temperature, um, uh, mechanical systems, uh, cooking, and and, and so on, and solar gain as well. So when, when the solar, when the sun rises, and actually heats up your house and your floor, that's all being considered. Um, then uh, an earth heat exchanger is a very efficient way to heat a passive house. So it's basically a tube that that goes into the ground. It's far away from your house, away from your exhaust, and it goes into the ground. And it pre-warms your, your air in, in the winter, and it pre-cools the air in the summer. And it brings it in into the, into the mechanical room, and it goes into your air heat exchanger, which is basically the lungs of the, of the house. And the heat exchanger, of course, it exchanges the, 
the heat from the outgoing air with the heat that uh, with the incoming air. And if this is not enough to heat the house, which mostly it is, but if it's minus 30, it, it might not be. So then there is an uh, uh, electric uh, resistance, resistance heater, which is often used. Um, now, because electricity is, is, yeah, isn't the cheapest and the most uh, economical, especially when it's produced in coal. So um, another uh, very effective heat source is radiant heating. Um, even if we just have radiant heating in the, in, the, in the main slab and have it very, very low, it will be en enough to heat your house. So there's no need for a regular furnace or a forced air uh, furnace. Um, and then the data reads that we use are, are very efficient. Um, they're very efficient and they're actually very small because they don't, yeah, they don't have a, 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 a combustion chamber just like a furnace and, and so on. Um, they, they usually have plastic tubing uh, compared to regular sheet metal um, just because there is, again, less heat loss. The plastic doesn't um, transfer heat as much as, as sheet metal. And then lastly, the, the, the HRVs are, are constantly running, so they never shut up. They're always running, but at a very low speed, so you actually don't hear them. And that actually creates a, your, your uh, living climate. Like, it's always the same. It, it doesn't fluctuate, especially in the summer when it gets warm. Um, maybe a little bit more about this picture, too. Um, uh, about the design. Um, design and orientation is, is very important in a passive house, of course. And so we want to orientate the the house towards the south, uh, plus minus 30 degrees. Um, we want to locate the windows so that they uh, get solar gain in the, in the winter, but they don't get uh, too much sun in, sun in the summer. Yeah, so basically that's, that's here. The sun becomes in here, it only kind of comes in here through the winter, and in the summer when the sun is high, um, you don't have it doesn't heat up, so you want to introduce shading devices. Uh, airtightness is the next important step. Um, one continuous airtight layer, and that's really important when we design a home. Um, the rule is that you must be able to go around the inside of the building with a red pen without once lifting it up. Um, you're always able to um, Combine different materials, of course. Uh, those of you who build homes know how it is. It's not always that simple, especially here in, in those detailed floor choice windows. Uh, it's very important that these seals are connected, that the vapor barrier is connected to the windows, that it's through the floor choice, and, and um, yeah, that you have your continuous seal. And in order to achieve the 0 0.6 air changes, Yeah, it's imperative to do a lower door test during construction and actually before the finishing is on, before drywall is on. Because at that point, you can actually still make changes. You can take your vapor barrier, if you see a leak, you walk around with a, with a smoke machine or an incense stick and you see where the, the, the air is going through. And at this point, you can change and, and remediate any issues if there are any. Um, yeah, another important step, of course, with air not yeah, with air tightness and insulation uh, kind of overlaps is that the materials are diffusion open to the outside, so they're more vapor open as you go towards the outside. So if you ever get vapor into the building envelope, it can dry out towards the outside in the summer season. Um, thermal bridge-free construction is the last um, uh, principle. Um, so if you if you look at passive house, they, 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 they look a bit different compared to your uh, regular mountain style. Um, because we want to avoid stormers, we want to avoid um, uh, cantilevers, penetrations, because every penetration is basically a thermal bridge. 
that leads out towards the outside and transfers your heat to the outside, um, which is again a heat loss that's not necessary. Um, so of course we can't always reduce all thermal uh, bridges, but we can minimize them. And if, if we can't, then we can put insulation on the outside, um, again, to reduce the heat loss. Um, yeah, as an example, if, if here you have a, a rafter that extends on the roof, you'd actually um, have the structure only on the inside of the building and then have a buildup on the, on, the, on the roof itself that's uh, separated so you don't have a continuous uh, piece of roof running outside. Uh, use high performance insulation where it makes sense, as a, an example about the headers in, in window. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to use insulation that is better than you maybe use in other uh, parts of your home just because you have less room to actually insulate. Um, or insulate the foundation walls. Again, the, the ground is uh, it's always cold, especially here. Uh, so it, it makes sense to increase the insulation towards the ground. In a passive house, you usually use six to eight inches um, on the ground. Um, so which is much different to the code, which is two or four inches, I believe. Uh, yeah, so what are the benefits of the passive house? Um, well, of course, reduced energy consumption, um, and therefore we have a smaller footprint. And of course, if we use less energy, again, back to the 50% uh, in the beginning, uh, of, or 60% space heating. So let's say we could reuse our space heating demand by 50%, that would reduce our greenhouse gas emissions significantly by about 20 to 25%. So wouldn't that be great if all houses would be passive, then we could easily lower our emissions by 20%. Um, yeah, so good side effects are high level of living comfort just because um, the walls are so insulated, the whole building envelope is so insulated, so you don't have uh, air movement um, as much. You don't have the draft from the furnace and maybe a leak through the windows uh, just because the whole building envelope is so tight and you have a constant air stream, it makes the, um, yeah, the comfort in the house um, very healthy, allergen free, because you have the constant air movement, you don't have any cold spots, you don't have any uh, draft. And therefore, of course, it minimizes the air leakage uh, through the building envelope, and which increases the longevity of your structure. Yeah, and then another benefit, of course, is natural lighting, because the windows are located um, not only to catch the view, but also to catch the, the natural light um, and to get shading in the summer. So that's why I put this picture. You see the shading devices here, um, which are very, very sleek, um, but they make a big difference, especially in the summer. So your house doesn't overheat. If you have a lot of uh, glass on the south side, which is great, um, it's always very important to consider the shading. Um, which then makes your cooling of your home in the, in the, in the summertime much, much simpler. Um, yeah, so that was it about new builds, and now we're looking a little bit about the retrofits. Um, because there is a lot of building substance that um, yeah, maybe has been built 20 years ago. Uh, there's a lot of houses with four inches insulation um, around, which, which isn't very much. But as long as the building substance is is good, or at least the foundation, it's, it's, it's always good considering to save the, the existing, again, just to, uh, to save what we have, reuse the existing, save it to, from going all to the landfill if possible. And it also lowers your construction costs, actually. And perhaps you have a bit more funds uh, left over to put in your energy efficiency measures. Um, yeah, again, it's similar. Um, similar to a new home, um, um, it's important to, to always look at the house as a system, especially if, if we're renovating, especially if we're renovating uh, one item at a, at a time. Say we're doing the windows first, 
Um, especially when you change the windows, maybe from, you know, those old steel windows, double pane sliders to new windows, it will really impact your, your house because you don't need, um, you don't have as much air loss. So then probably your, your uh, heating system is not balanced anymore. So it, it's very important when you retrofit that you look at the whole picture, maybe get an energy advisor in, which I know Jody will have next meeting or in the next workshop. Um, yeah, upgrade the water heater, but always look at the, the house as a system. Um, because if you, if you improve one thing, some, something else could fail if it's not um, assessed properly. Um, yeah, again, high efficiency um, HRE and make it balanced or perhaps the, the existing can be reused or upgraded. Um, upgrade water heater, that's, that's also a very good, um, very good point to save energy just because the old ones are not uh, very efficient. Um, and then, yeah, so there is Enerfit. Enerfit is basically from Passive House um, <clears throat> as well. So it's, it's a program that certifies, certifies renovations. Um, but the, the heat demands are not as, as, as low. Whereas for a new building, it's 50 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. For, uh, for a retrofit, the, the threshold is 20 kilowatt hours. So there is a bit more leeway just because it's harder with existing buildings to make them as energy efficient as a new build. But similar to the, to the uh, passive house principles, um, what we want to do, we want to improve the thermal insulation. We want to look at the, the air tightness, make sure it's, it's, it's sealed properly. The connections are done right to the windows. Um, especially again, that those um, yeah, weak spots floor joists at the basement um, to, the, to the ground and to do uh, reduce thermal bridges. Um, again, and probably the easiest way to reduce thermal bridges is apply insulation on the exterior of the building, uh, wrap insulation, um, because basically every stud in, in your wall is a thermal bridge. Um, then again, the, the ventilation with HRV um, upgrades to a high energy, uh, high efficiency um, product, and probably even a smaller unit because again, if you insulate your building better, you can retain more heat, and you use less energy. Um, yeah. So, and then the the last step would basically be a, a renewable energy source. Um, because passive house is not, there, there is a limit to, to how much um, energy can be used from, from fossil fuels. Um, but basically, a passive house is net zero ready. So it is, um, yeah, as soon as you put your solar panels on or, or other uh, local sources such as wind or um, <clears throat> you would be net zero. And again here, reduced energy use uh, lowers your emissions and your, and your footprint. Um, yeah, that's it from me for now. Um, thank you for atten your attention. As I said, there's some uh, wall samples which we can uh, discuss further. And uh, Windows as well, thank you very much.
So my name is Ben Hildebrandt. I come from the research department in SAIT, uh, Applied Research and Innovation Services. I'm part of the Green Building Technologies team. We research all sorts of different areas having to do with green buildings from materials and uh, new materials and products that can be used, which is my area that I'm focusing on right now, to solar thermal, solar electric technologies, smart building systems, and architectural ecology, a whole lot of different things. And it's, it's a pleasure for me to come out and talk to you a little bit. And I had a few thoughts going through my mind um, as, as Raphael was talking. So I was kind of curious, how many in the room have a home that's newer than 2005 that you're living in? So a few. Who has a home between 1990 and 2005? A few more. Who has a home older than 1990 that they're currently in? Oh. <laughs> I actually, it's funny, I, I spent, before I was at, at State, I spent several years as a building envelope consultant in Calgary, focusing on the, the shell of the building, both in existing homes having issues and new homes and buildings under construction, and trying to make sure things are done right and fix things that were done wrong. And me and one of my colleagues would, would joke with each other all the time, if we're trying to make sure all these buildings are done right and done proper, but I lived in a house that was built in 1981, he lived in a house built in 79, we know our windows leak, we know we had a whole ton of air just blowing through our walls, but there's different advantages to different stages of homes and it's all about taking, taking into context what home you're in and what, what the best thing is to do. I think the passive house system is amazing, especially if you're building new to think, you know, I'm gonna spend a bit more money up front on my home and I'll have much lower bills. And then I totally agree with all the other advantages that Raphael was talking about, about increased comfort. You can have increased health. There's a study done years ago, I never did find the source study, a large community of high efficiency homes in New Zealand that were built super airtight. So they all had the heat recovery ventilators, which I'll get into a little bit more later on, which provided them with fresh, clean air all the time. And they had a significantly lower amount of sick days from work and from school as a result. Um, I'll get into that a bit, a bit later, but I just want to touch on that. And I think also that whatever you can do to improve the shell of your building, that's where you need to start. If you're looking at doing a renovation to increase the performance of your building, you start with the shell. And heating systems, cooling systems, ventilation, that, that comes later. And everything does need to be addressed when you're, when you're doing work on your home. So this is our building on, on state campus. Um, I wish I would have looked up and put the link on there. We do a, a monthly tour, the third Wednesday of every month in the evening, I believe at 5.30, we have a public tour. You can sign up online. Somewhere on state.ca you can find it. I haven't put forth the effort to find it, sorry. Um, so today I'm gonna go through a few different things. I'm gonna talk about the types of efficient heating systems. I'm not gonna cover every type. I'm covering the most common ones, and, and for most of you, these will probably be familiar. There's nothing too new, but there are some other systems out there. Um, Raphael talked about the, the earth tubes. We have one of those in our building, which basically takes our intake air before it goes into our ventilation system, and it runs it through about 50 feet below the ground. And what we found last winter, we have a whole ton of sensors in our building, and that was raising that air temperature from the time it entered the tubes to the time it got to our heat recovery ventilator to go to the rest of the building. It had raised the temperature about 10 degrees in the wintertime. So and when you look at a ventilation system in, in older homes, in a 1980 home, the fresh air comes in from your furnace and also just coming in through walls and windows, various places around there. And so when you're running your furnace in an older home, you're just dumping a lot of that expensive heated air outside. So when you have a higher efficiency heating system and ventilation, you can recover some of that, some of that heat. And I'll get into that a bit more later. But so types of efficient heating systems, what you can do for a minor upgrade to your system. If you're not looking at undertaking a whole house renovation or spending thousands of dollars to upgrade your heating system, we're gonna talk about some basic, simpler things you can do and then I'm gonna get into major upgrades to heating systems. So what are the different types of efficient heating systems that we have? Everyone knows a forced air furnace, they're common, they're everywhere. They are quite efficient and they are a very effective solution in, in North America right now. Right now the code requires you have a system that's at least 92% efficient and that's looking at the heat 
generated in the, through the energy from the gas and combustion, comparing it to the energy that's actually going to be used to heat your, your home, how much of that is lost through the exhaust in your furnace. So that's kind of what that fuel efficiency is, is looking at. Most are gas powered, there's also electric uh, furnaces in there, they just have an electric heating element similar to a space heater you might have sitting on your floor to warm your feet under your desk at work, because maybe before you work in the old, old office building. Um, and then also, newer furnaces that I believe they've been available for over a decade now, maybe towards 15 years or more. Um, the blower fans you have that actually circulates the air, you can get multi-stage or variable speed blower fans, so it's not just blowing at this full air rate all the time, but it can vary at speed to have a, a lower rate of airflow depending on the demands. You can save actually a significant amount of energy from that in your furnace electrical operation for circulation. So that's, that's furnaces. I still think they're an amazing solution in Canada to use. And another thing with them too is it's something that every mechanical installer is, is experienced with. When you look at some of the newer technologies that are out there, like one thing I'm not going to go too much into is a ground source heat pump. Tonight I'm actually not going to touch on it more than what I'm saying right now. But that's basically using the heat from the ground to help heat your home and also cool your home in the summertime. But you get into systems like that, you have specialized installers that are experienced in that, which there aren't as many out there and they are a bit more of a costly system. Other systems we have that are very common are hydronic systems. So this takes a fluid, quite often it's water mixed with glycol going through tubing, often in your floors. You can have wall panels set up as well. Many people, since, since the mid 90s, in kind of mid to higher end homes, the basements will have hydronic loops through the floor. And that fluid is heated either by an electric or a hot water, hot water heater, sometimes it's a hot water tank, similar to what you use for your domestic water. Sometimes it'll be a dedicated gas boiler or electric boiler that will heat those systems. These systems use a series of pumps and valves to circulate the, the fluid. You see in the, the image there, they've got orange lines painted. That's kind of where walls are going when this basement gets finished and each area can have a specific zone, as it's called, with a separate valve. So when there's a demand in that zone, it sends heat to that zone. So uh, hydronic systems can be very efficient. They're also very comfortable as well because it's, it's a radiant heat that, that comes towards you. When we look at that kind of comfort or that heat that we feel, 60% um, of what our body feels is radiant heat. So that's the heat we feel on one surface. If this was a really old and efficient monitor, I'd feel a lot of heat coming off it right now. I don't. Um, but 60% of what we feel is the, the heat or the temperature coming off a surface that's within a dozen or so feet of us. And 40% of what we feel is actual air temperature or surface temperatures touching our skin. So when we look at something that we can do to, to radiantly heat our homes, it can really have a great impact on our, on our comfort. And you can also, with these systems, you don't have to have them as warm. A radiant floor will be at a lower temperature when it's heating your space than the air coming out of your furnace vents. Um, another thing to think about for, for radiant heat, um, I had a friend a couple years ago who on Facebook one day she posted, why is it that 20 degrees in the summertime inside my house feels way colder, or way, sorry, way hotter than 20 degrees in the wintertime? And I had to resist going too deep into it and saying, oh, you've got a bad house or anything. But she's like, that wouldn't happen to be when you're sitting in your living room with, with your large, I've been to her twice, I knew what it was like. It wouldn't be particularly in your living room with your large windows, would it? And yes, of course. So when we have older windows in our homes, and this is a plug for, for these higher efficiency windows that, that we have, you, you look at, uh, going a bit into building science or what Raphael was talking about before. You look at a wall system or a window, you have your outside temperature. In the wintertime in Canmore a few weeks ago, we were down low minus 20s into the 30s. So outside that's, outside, that's the temperature that we have on our wall or on our window. Inside, on those cold days, we're jacking the heat up to 23 or 24. Because I like short sleeves all year round, not just in the summer. And somewhere between there, you go through the 
the wall, we use a temperature gradient as that, that temperature of the materials in the wall goes up to that inside temperature from that low outside temperature. And however thicker that wall is, means the warmer that inside plane is going to be or how much insulation value there is. So if you have a really high performing wall, you have an air temperature of 2324, you can have that wall temperature, that surface that's radiating to you, that's going to feel 20 degrees, 19 degrees. And that's pretty good. My house, built in 1981, two by four insulated wall, it's minus 30 outside. That inside surface on my wall, I actually took a laser thermometer, which you can check out. It's around here, it's on the table there from the Biosphere Institute. You can grab one to play around with. I waste lots of time with that. My inside surface of my walls during that cold spell was about 13 degrees. And so that's the temperature I was feeling. And you look at that comfort. If you want to feel comfort when you go to that cold temperature rating in two, you have to jack up your heating system even more. So if you're looking at a major renovation in your home, especially with older homes, when you're due for replacing your siding anyways, you want to update the look or it's old and falling off or, or whatever, it's a really good time to upgrade the insulation. If you can increase that inside temperature on your walls, it even has a great impact on your windows too. If you look at one of those old double pane sliders, when you've got ice creeping up the inside of your windows, that's a good indication of what the inside temperature of that glass is. When you can upgrade your windows, it can increase that inside temperature and increase your comfort. Um, but I digress a bit, but uh, sorry, I'm a nerd. Um, so hydronic systems are great. And as I beat you to death with, radiant heating is a very good system. And, and the way you feel radiance can really improve your comfort in your home. Um, other high efficiency systems, these are systems that have been proved really well in the States and overseas, and they're gaining more and more use in Canada, are heat pump systems. And these are basically a system, it's, it's literally an air conditioner that works in two directions. It uses um, expanding and compressing of fluid to gain heat advantage. And they're very efficient systems. The one drawback to them is that in the super, super cold weather, they don't work so well. They're really good down to, so this picture above in, our, in, in my shop at the Green Building Technologies Lab, we've got two of these, we've got one exterior unit that runs two of these interior cartridges. Last winter, I was able to spend a lot more time in the shop, so I knew that both systems were keeping up really good until about minus 15. And our shop isn't super insulated, it's a standard shop, but when it gets down below, you still get really good heat out of it, but it takes a lot longer to kind of recharge the system to pump that heat out. Um, there is one of the manufacturers I actually just heard recently, they have a hybrid unit which has uh, natural gas heat in it as well when it is needed. So, but heat pump systems are really cool. They are really low energy. The only energy going into a system like this is to run a couple of pumps. So just a little bit of electricity to run some pumps compared with a furnace where you've got natural gas it's burning at over a thousand degrees to heat your air to 22 degrees. So it's interesting to kind of think of embodied energy and, and how, how it works out. So there's so much. So heat pumps are very efficient and effective systems, and the technology is increasing at lower and lower temperatures. So right now, if you're looking at a major upgrade and switching your heating systems, heat pump is an option, but also keep in mind you want to have something back up for a really cold day. So if you want to keep that gas fireplace, that would still work. Another thing to look at in your heating system is, is ventilation. And this also kind of comes into cooling. In my mind, in, in Canada and in Alberta overall, we have a set number of days a year on average where you really need cooling and often opening up a window can solve that. Um, another thing that really, really helps in a home if you're looking at doing renovations, even it doesn't even have to be too major, but adding shading, as Raphael talked about, to prevent that hot summer sun from getting into your windows. That's one of the best things you can do to help with uh, lowering your, your cooling needs in the summertime. But there are different types of ventilation. I touched on earlier that the older homes, the fresh air was just kind of from, you run your furnace and it's exhausting some air outside a little bit. Mostly it's bringing air inside, pressuring up your home, and that air is leaking out through your walls and leaky windows in, in various spots. Newer homes that have been built, especially since the mid-90s and newer, we're building them more airtight. 
builder to pay more attention to how well that plastic poly in the walls is sealed. And so there is more need for, for ventilation. Homes built since I believe the mid 2000s will have often it's an unlabeled mysterious switch right near your thermostat, which that's to turn on your furnace fan and just leave it on circulating full time. But if you just have a standard furnace, then all you're doing is constantly exhausting and forcing that nice warm air outside and sucking cold air in from, from outside. And those homes often are also, a lot of them are tied into the bath and kitchen fans as well. So you flip on that switch, it'll run your furnace. Your furnace will also be tied in, but when it turns on for heating, it's also gonna switch on your bath and kitchen fans to kind of exhaust some of, some of the air so you kind of keep a balanced system. If you're not pressurizing your house or having a negative pressure, which can create can create some issues, especially in the wintertime. Um, and now we get to heat recovery ventilators. And I'll explain to you exactly what a heat recovery ventilator is. I should have found a really good graphic, but I didn't, I'm sorry. But if you, if you think of the radiator on your car, you've got radiator fluid from in your engine, and it's going through all these fine fins, you have air blowing over it. A heat recovery ventilator works in the exact same way as that. It's two air streams passing by each other in a radiator type interface. They're not mixed. So what's happening is you're taking that air, that return air from the large barrels at the bottom of your floor and going back to the furnace. It's taking air like that and it's passing that exhaust air past the intake air coming in from outside and it's able to transfer the heat from that air without actually mixing it. So you can keep these heat recovery ventilators running all the time and most of them are 200 watts, 100 watts or less, so it's not a super high energy load. You keep them running 24 seven and you're constantly changing that air, but you're not dumping that heat outside. I believe pretty much all the systems are about above 80% efficient. I think there are some that might be a bit lower, but most of the ones that are prevalent today are over 80% or are even some that are in the 90%. So that's 90% of that heat is being transferred between the air streams. And as I mentioned before, there was that study that neighborhood of these super airtight homes that had these ventilation systems going, heat recovery ventilators, and it really had an impact on their health because it's continually bringing in clean, fresh air. It's not recirculating the air in their system. I look at my house and most furnaces out there, you have that return air. If you follow the ducting, it's gonna go through your floor systems. Quite often the, the return air doesn't go through a, a set metal duct. It just goes through the framing in your walls and your floors and finds its way to the furnace. There also be a, a duct coming in from outside, mixes that air together and just recirculates it through your house, through the furnace. And so your air is continually being recircled, recirculated and recirculated. And you're not bringing in that much fresh air. And it's getting as clean as your furnace filter will allow. But with a heat recovery ventilator, what it's doing is all that exhaust air is going outside. None of it's being recycled. So if you have a cold and you're coughing, if you're bringing a certain virus from countries overseas, you're coughing in your home, it's recirculating around. With a heat recovery ventilator, it's able to bring in fresh, clean air. And that also is a huge advantage when it comes to cooking as well. Um, if anyone wants to nerd out a bit on kind of chemicals in the air in your home, you can go online to YouTube and, go and look up the home chem a study that will be on the Building Performance YouTube channel. And it's a study being done down in Texas at one of the universities down there. They've outfitted this home with millions of dollars worth of sensors to measure air quality. And they're completing various daily tasks, such as cook, frying an egg and frying bacon and seeing how that affects the chemicals in the air. Like what's coming off of that? How, it's, how it, is that affecting us? I think one of the things you can do in your home to kind of improve your comfort and your health. I think one of the best things you can do is look at how can you install a heat recovery ventilator. They can be installed independently with ducting wrap. I'll talk about plastic piping that goes in instead of metal duct. Um, that's the best way to do it, but you can also just tie it in with your existing furnace system. So the main advantage you'd be getting from that is not just dumping all that warm, um, expensive air outside. So you can keep that keep that heat in your home and have nice fresh air all the time. And the beauty of the heat recovery ventilators as well is it's a low airflow. It's not like your, when your furnace comes on, you kind of feel that draft coming up 
all my kids run for the registers right by my, my I think it's still like a 1980s sliding door. It looks really cool, but they'll sit right by it because there's a register there and be nice and warm. Um, with a heat recovery ventilator, you don't have that high airflow, so it's not as loud. And you don't have those noisy drafts. It's just a constant slow airflow that provides lots of good fresh air. So these are the basic types of systems. I touched on the earth tubes as well as a method to kind of preheat the air coming in. Um, you can do ground source heat pumps, which I talked about before. Similar to a heat pump system like this where you have inside cartridges, but instead of an outside unit, similar to an air conditioning unit, what it's doing is it's running that piping down through the ground. And as I said before, those are slightly expensive systems. Um, I heard of a home that was being designed in the northeastern states, and the architect, the owner, the homeowner, and the architect were originally looking at um, a heat pump system, which they budgeted sixty thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars years ago. I heard about it for for this heat ground source heat pump system to put in, but instead they determined, you know, let's use that money, let's upgrade the building envelope and add more insulation, and then they're able to go with a system that had just two cartridges like this within their home to heat it. And mind you, they didn't have as cold, cold of days in that time as we do here. Um, but just two units like that, and, and they tied into a single outdoor unit, and that was heating a, I believe it was about a 3,000 square foot house. So it's really cool, and, and if you'll no one rings me and I might beat that horse again and again and again, the importance of kind of focusing on the, the shell and the envelope of your building. But many of us, many of you that are here today probably aren't looking at building a new home right now. And you might not be in the market or in the position, which you'll find out after next week's uh, presentation, the next presentation, if you're in a financial position for a major renovation to look at improving your, your heat recovery or sorry, your heating systems in your home and increasing your comfort. So now, if you're not in that market, what are some of the things you can do for kind of a minor upgrade to your system? You can look at basically, these kind of fall within the, the realm of optimization. So one of the things you can do, which I've been, I've been a homeowner for 12 years now, I've had two homes, and I still have not gotten into the good habit of changing my furnace filter regularly. So that improves the efficiency of your furnace. As soon as I get packed up with dust, it's reducing the airflow. And also that drastically affects the quality of the air you're breathing as well. Because every ounce of that air that comes through your heat vents is going through that, uh, through that filter. So change your filter regularly, and this will provide optimum efficiency of, of, your, of your heating system. Also, having your furnace cleaned recently I know I won't get an honest show of hands of who's had their furnace cleaned within the past two years. <laughs> hey, everyone's just going to say that. <laughs> um, that makes a large impact. And also, when someone, when a qualified mechanical contractor comes in to clean your furnace and look at it, they'll often be able to find little things that might be wrong with your furnace, maybe some adjustments you need to be made, maybe a sensor needs to be replaced, and that can help it run at peak efficiency for that. And for example, our house was built in 1981, we're still using the original furnace because it's still functioning well and working. And I want to do a major envelope upgrade to my home soon, so I know it won't be the same furnace after that. So I'm hesitant to replace it with ledge or something like that. Um, another thing you can do is use a programmable or a smart thermostat. Nest and Ecobee have done a really good marketing job of spreading their wares and, and, and talking about all the advantages. One of the main advantages of those systems is they're smart. They think and they kind of anticipate after a while as to what your heating needs are for comfort. And they can be quite simple to operate in the base modes. But you don't need to get a super smart thermostat like that. You can just get any thermostat that you can set a daytime temperature and a nighttime temperature. When you look at what energy it takes to heat your home, it's basically what's that temperature difference that you want to maintain between the outside temperature and the inside temperature. If it's minus 30 outside and you want to keep it to plus 20 inside your home, that's 50 degrees temperature difference that your, that your furnace is trying to maintain. 
if you want to, if you're going away for a few days, let's drop your inside temperature down to 16 degrees. That's, you've saved four degrees of temperature that your furnace is trying to maintain. And you can save a lot of money from that over the years. And I nerded out recently with a book on sleep, and our bodies inherently want to drop their temperature a few degrees when we go to sleep at night. So if we lower our temperature in our homes and our bedrooms, we can get to sleep better, have a higher quality sleep, and we can save energy too. Um, so another thing to do that you can look at doing is having your system balanced. Who here has, particularly in a, actually in any home, who here has rooms in your home that are un, that are noticeably colder or warmer than the rest of your house at different times of the year? Yeah. One of the things that, that's sad in, in the way that mechanical systems are done in the majority of new homes now is they're installed designed and installed using rule of rules of thumb meaning this is a 2,000 square foot house it's got two by six insulated walls there's not too many windows okay it'll require let's say oh an 80,000 BTU furnace so we'll pop an 80,000 BTU furnace in there when it comes to oh let's distribute the air okay let's put a, a heat vent in each room oh the living room has a really big window we'll put two heat vents right there and quite often and I oversimplify it I know a lot of these installers do a bit more thought than that but it is possible for them to do a calculation to determine what's the heating that's needed for each room within the house and to provide that heat how many cubic feet per minute need to come out of that vent and it is possible to balance the system to provide that so every room in your home, when you set your thermostat to 22 degrees, every room in your home could achieve that 22 degrees, not 22 degrees in your hall by your thermostat, and then this one room over here, with my son Benson's room, eight feet by eight feet, one vent in there, it gets up to 26, 28 degrees. <laughs> my master bedroom, so his room has about eight feet of exterior wall, my master bedroom has about 20 feet of exterior wall, and this is an old 1981 house, remember? Really boringly insulated walls. I have about, yeah, there is, sorry, 20 feet of exterior wall. I also only have one heat vent. So he's cooking, we're a bit freezing, but both my wife and I like lots of blankets, so it's not too much of a, of a trouble. But one of the things that's possible is to look at having your existing system optimized and balanced to to increase your comfort and, and increase its efficiency. And there are some restrictions in how much can be done with that, especially with all the ducting being hidden within, within floor systems and within walls. Um, I'm ranting a bit too much. Okay, there's not too much to talk about major upgrades to heating systems. So luckily, um, there are different things that you can look at doing. If you have a really old furnace, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't look that bad. But you can look at what can you do to just replace your heating system only if it's not coupling with a larger renovation. And as Raphael said, and I touched on as well, we need to treat our homes as a system. If your furnace is on its last legs and you know you need to replace it, then you've got to replace it. But if you just want to improve your efficiency by replacing your furnace, keep in mind, if, you have, if you're planning a major renovation to your home, you might increase the insulation value of it within the next five or 10 years you should maybe wait because you're going to change the size of the furnace that you'll need. So when you're replacing your, your system, make sure you get a unit that's properly sized for your home. Get, get an experienced contractor that's going to take the time to do the calculations to verify exactly what you need. A lot of, a lot of contractors might use general rules of thumb and add a buffer and say, okay, you need 55,000 BTUs, let's jack it up to 70,000, make sure you're nice and comfortable. But if you oversize a unit like that, you're gonna have a furnace that runs in shorter cycles more often, because it'll heat up your home a lot faster. But it's actually better for your furnace and the, and the longevity of it to have one that's properly sized. It's gonna run on longer cycles, but that's what it's designed for, to be more efficient, efficient. And then when you replace your furnace, you also need to look at the rest of the system, the ducting as well, and make sure everything all works together. Furnaces, despite seem to be a bunch of flames that somehow heat up the air and circulate through your house. They're a pretty complex system and they're based on air pressures and airflow. 
And so you need to look at what's, what that furnace needs in terms of a ducting system so it's, it's operating at peak performance. So when you replace your system, you might need to do some adjustments to your ducts, but you need to make sure that, that there is some attention paid to, to that. You need to make sure that the flow rates, pressure, and balance of the system are correct. Now, when you're looking at a heating system upgrade as part of a major renovation, hopefully you don't start your renovation in that manner. Um, you need to, as, as, as I've beat the horse a few times already tonight, start with the fabric first. Start with the other aspects of the home design. If you increase the performance of your home, improve it, you reduce your heat loss to your home, that will reduce the size of a heating system you need and will affect the exact system that needs to be, needs to be installed. So you need to keep in mind that. And as I said before, you need to make sure the whole system's addressed in that, not just replacing the furnace, but looking, taking that opportunity to optimize the ducting. If you have a really old home, you're doing a, excuse me, a major renovation, it might be worth looking at the possibility of replacing the ducting in, in, in some cases. But it's, it's looking at how far you're going with your renovations and what works best and what works best for you and keeping in mind what do you want out of your home? What are the things you're trying to do with your home? Are you looking at increasing your comfort? And just lowering your bills? There's a lot of different things you might be looking for. I mean, and when you're making these decisions, it's thinking about what's best for you and what are, what are your goals? Um, and I already touched on that kind of the duct systems. And my one final point is the importance of hiring a skilled contractor. When you're looking at getting any work done on your heating system, particularly with replacements or installing a whole new system, especially if it might be a newer system such as a heat pump system, make sure you're getting the contractor that's experienced with that system. They have a knowledge of it and they're able to answer any questions that, that you might have. And most importantly, they can give you a bit of a run through of, of how to operate it at the end. I've had conversations with couple of the contractors that are here tonight to participate in the, the Q&A and there was a great set of knowledgeable contractors out here in, in Cranmore and uh, one thing to keep in mind also with the contractor is the lowest price is not always necessarily the best deal for you. I've, I've learned that many times in the, in the building envelope realm in Calgary when I was working for several years there in managing bids for condo complex repairs. Everyone always takes the lowest bid, but then in the end costs sometimes go up. So when you're selecting a contractor, find someone that's gonna answer your questions, that they know the systems they're installing, and, and don't just focus on that lowest price. Because when, they, when, you, when you do, when you're looking at a major upgrade to your heating system, if it's not done right the first time, it creates a lot of stress lot of cost as well possibly down the road so take your time trust your gut pick someone that's is knowledgeable and that's that's about all I have to say really about heating systems I could go into a lot in a lot more depth in some areas feel free to once once we're done the q and I'll stick around for a bit as well if you have any other questions that, that are still um, weighing on your minds but uh, thank you very much for your time tonight Sorry, what was that question again? I'm wondering if a combination of the heat pump and the HRV would be a, a suitable replacement for a natural gas furnace. Yes, it would be. Because the, the HRV would provide your um, full fresh air circulation. The beauty of, of a heat pump is that you have the exterior, exterior unit with only a, a couple of small pipes. 
that have to tie into the interior unit. So the interior cartridges you put on your walls, so that leaves you a lot of options with what you can do. What about relative cost? Is it rocket science? I mean, can you get it done? Um, I mean, uh, right on the cost, uh, I'd say it's, it's like it's like everything when it comes to high efficiency, it's it's a lifespan. The biggest problem I think you're going to see with heat pumps, uh, as was mentioned, is lack of expertise. That's where you're going to run into issues. Um, I've come across a couple of buildings in town that have some. There's probably three people, maybe, in the valley that I would trust to look at them. So that's mm -hmm. that, that's kind of your biggest issue. Every high efficiency issue, um, uh, unit is going to have some inherent problems, and we're seeing some, even from the first generation, um, you know, ten or so years ago, that are starting to show up there. People just didn't have the knowledge for installation. Um, just small little things that are causing problems for us now. We're at a stage now where uh, high efficiency furnaces, on demand water heaters are getting up to almost 98%. They're expensive. They will pay for themselves over time. But um, again, the same thing, you're, you're, you're going to have a lot of issues in the next kind of five, ten years with just small or old faults. But if you pay, say, 5000 for a 97% efficient gas furnace, what would the cost of the heat pump and the HRV be compared to that? I'm not sure what the cost of a heat pump would be. Um, I know an average HRV unit is probably going to run uh, in around about $1,800. Um, retrofitting a HRV unit is not particularly easy because you got to bring in a lot of ductwork. Kind of more for a new build, in, in my opinion. But um, you know, I'm also on the, the furnace side of things, so you know, furnaces. <laughs> <laughs> I think another thing with HRVs too, in a retrofit aspect, is kind of how how tight is your mechanical room? Because these HRV units are probably three feet by two feet by two feet, at least. Yeah. Some you, some you might can be get, You can get that. some smaller ones. Yeah, I, I can say if, if you're looking at the system as, as, at your system as a whole, um, and you're doing a, a lot of work in there, you'll get you'll get the value out of it then. Um, if you're just looking to try and retrofit your your house as it is, um, I, I I don't think you're going to get the value out of just the HRV unit at a heat pump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just. Uh, thinking, were, were you here last time? The gentleman with, with Hellbent. Um, Gilles Lerner. Yes. Yes. Um. Can you look at this? Uh, kind of a general question. Uh, what the coverage is on this. Um, but uh, it's put out there anyway. Yeah, it's quite an amazing. You get a townhouse and you get the middle unit. <laughs> I mean, your heating loads are directly proportional to the surface area of all your outside surfaces. And I think townhomes, duplexes, whatever, like that densification coming from Calgary, raw, raw densification, and yet we're still sprawling. Um, but uh, I, think, I think part of it is what do you want from a home as well? 
there are a lot of duplexes going up in the newer neighborhoods, but there's still a larger portion of single family homes because in the end, at the end of the day, that's what we want. But in terms of efficiency, yeah, duplexes and and uh, row townhomes are are a great thing when it comes to how can you have a sizable living space with the lowest heating load as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that is a good point, and so especially passive houses as well. I mean, the bigger the building is, you know, if you have an apartment or a condo or or townhomes, um. Yeah, the more efficient it comes, uh, it becomes, and the more cost effective as well. Um, yeah, as an example, in, in Germany, um, all municipal and public buildings have to be built to pass a pass standard, um, just because they realize that this is the way to go. And, and um, yeah, there is a bit more upfront cost, but it is basically um, the most efficient way to to to. Uh, maintain buildings, especially large buildings. Yeah, when you think of base designs of a home too, like to increase efficiency by the architectural design, the most efficient shape out there in terms of heat loss is a sphere or a ball. Mm -hmm. The most efficient buildable shape is a cube, like an exact four-sided cube. Unfortunately, uh, the architecture desires of our time uh, don't favor cubes that much. Sorry, question. Mm -hmm. I just actually followed up on that point. I think it's probably a question, probably for Raphael or whoever wants to take it. But one of the aspects of mountain architecture, if you love or if you hate humans, or you won't hate humans, is the great mountain views and so on. But aside from the extra space that you get on the peak, which is very theoretical, my understanding is that the standard. Structures in most of those cities are pretty low bar value. And I'm just wondering if, if there are any practical things that can be done in terms of retrofitting any of those as you can see with that kind of work going on where people are trying to improve the R value of all the ceilings. Uh, yeah, no, and that can certainly be done because in a lot of uh, depends on the on the truss cavity, how much space do you have and a lot of those um, yeah truss roofs are insulated with blown in insulation so it's definitely possible to to um, add more insulation and just blow more in but um yeah you, so back i guess to the, to the point before the more volume you have the more the more uh, building out of offer you have and the more heat do you have to generate right so that comes back to i guess to its fair um yeah, the, the more compact the, the building is, the less volume you have and, and the easier it is to heat it. But um, yeah, so I think back to your question, Rick, um, yeah, it's certainly possible to, to add insulation to, to the roofs as long as there is an attic hatch and um, you're actually able to get in there and able to walk around and uh, add more insulation. I think one of the struggles with the cathedral ceilings like that too is Sometimes it's a scissor truss where you've got one slope below that you see inside and you have another slope up above with an attic space. And most of the homes I've seen that we've been doing work on don't have an attic hatch like that. Quite often they're, they're an eye joist construction for that. And moisture issues as a result of that. One of the main problems with those roofs is getting moisture into them and not, them not having proper ventilation. Um, I think one of the simplest things you can do to increase the R value would actually just be dropping the ceiling a couple inches. Just put on a couple inches of board insulation and then put drywall on there. You don't have to address the lighting, but that's probably the simplest and quickest fix. <coughs> the only way you're getting inside, there's a house in Calgary that in my past firm we did, we did some work on. We had to rip off the roof from the top and it was not a cheap uh, endeavor. <coughs> Say an extra step there as well, and with the addition of a HOV, if you've got uh, heat recovery ventilation and vents up there, pulling in, in back that, uh, that hot air that's escaping mm -hmm. and bring it back in. Uh, there's one or two places in town that have something similar to that. Um, that's probably one of the only other ways then to, to recover some of that heat that you would in those big vaulted ceilings. Mm -hmm.
if it's done right, it's awesome, but it can be done wrong really easily. And it's the most expensive insulation option, right? Well, the second most expensive, the most expensive is this new product called Aerogel, which is like gold in the bottle, essentially. <laughs> that's, price more, that's more for space, space yeah. travel, right? Yeah. For when we go to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, spray foam insulation, it's, it's become a really good solution for, for providing air tightness, insulation, and, and retarding any vapor flow all in one product. And it, it lasts well. The, the main concern really with it is, is proper installation. It has to be done properly, and you do a, you're supposed to do a pass two inches at a time. If they do it too thick, it doesn't cure properly. If the mix of the part A and part B of it isn't proper, it's not going to cure fully. And there are some, some manufacturers are getting greener and greener or healthier with the components of it, but I believe still the majority of the spray foams out there, you need to be out of the house for 24 hours because there's some nasty off gas <laughs> for the first part. Yeah, and if there is a gap, where if there's just no insulation and it's minus 30, the problem is that really all the moisture goes to that point and goes through. So you go... If you see, uh, you know, ice build up on the, on the rafters at the roof of a house, that's, that's where the air comes out, right? And if the whole house is insulated with spray foam, then that problem gets even worse at those locations. Um, so yeah, it, it has the best insulation value, that's, that's right, but um, that's about it. Like when you're looking at an embodied carbon standpoint, and actually in Green Building Technologies Lab right now, we're working with someone uh, in Cottage Club at Ghost Lake to look at doing a net zero uh, or a zero carbon residential design for their home. So we've been looking at, at the different products that are out there, but when it comes to embodied carbon content for insulation, spray foam and the foam board insulation have the highest uh, embodied carbon embodied carbon equivalent with other greenhouse gases and, and energy as well. Could just a minor comment on replacing furnace filters and flying the lights. You really don't have to do that because for $80 you can buy a furnace filter that can clean your bathtub and it's light panel. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I make one addition to um, something you had said earlier on about uh, changing the filter more regularly, um, it's this is just a, a little tip. <clears throat> As we see this a lot during the winter, I get a lot of phone calls after hours, and um, it'll be that my furnace is blowing cold air. It's not working. It's not heating. It's just cold air. First thing I say to everyone is, okay, do me a favor. Go down to your furnace, pull out the filter. Does it look slightly off white? Yes. Okay. Pull it out. Turn your furnace off. Turn your furnace on. Furnace will restart ninety percent of the time. That lack of airflow through a um, through a furnace filter puts a huge amount of strain onto your heat exchanger, a massive amount, and people just don't do it here. Um, if you've got a thick kind of filtery filter, uh, it's really really worth changing it every month throughout the winter season. Very few people do it. Um, you know, me personally, uh, I don't need much filtration through my air. I don't have any breathing problems. I get like cheaper filters and I change it every two months. But the ones that you're talking about there, those ones, yeah, again, every month, you gotta take them out, do them, make sure they're dry. And yeah, it'll- uh, Did you clean them in 10 minutes? Yep, yeah, just make sure it dries off and then, yeah, it really, really helps the longevity of your heat exchanger.
that's how much you were acting, I guess. Solar panels, it's, it's really nice that solar electric is at the lowest cost it's ever been right now, and it's continually going down and down. And it's really when it comes to solar for any electrical use inside the home, it's, it's really a question of are you looking for that payback or not? And what are your reason for, reasons for, for getting solar? If you want to be environmental and reduce your, your load on the grid, keep in mind that when the sun goes down, you still need the same size of the grid. Um, but... Solar panels for electricity for the heat pump is a, a good option in, in my mind, but I think it's, again, it's kind of looking at the house as a system, your whole home, kind of designing it, if, whether it's a new home or a, or a retrofit you're doing, try and reduce all your loads, both heating, gas loads, electrical loads as much as you can, and then look at filling those loads with, with heating systems. And with solar, it's kind of a combination of What's your finances? What what's available for a solar system? What are the costs going to be for that? Because right now in Alberta, one of our struggles is in in the economics of making a solar electric system feasible is that our electricity is pretty darn cheap, and we have to kind of keep connected to the grid anyway. So even if we're using next to no electricity every month, we still got all those admin charges, which a lot of them are fixed fee regardless. Um, one example, we were involved in the construction of the five metamine houses in northeast Calgary that were net zero target homes, put a lot of solar electricity on those homes. And what they found is they're, sure, they're getting credit from the utility company in the summertime when they're generating excess electricity, but they're just getting it at that per cents a kilowatt hour of credit. But then in the wintertime when they're using more electricity than they're generating, they're paying that per cents a kilowatt plus all the admin fees still. So it's a whole economic equation to kind of kind of reflect on. And I'm not sure if I did directly answer that question. <laughs> I think yeah, awesome. Um, well, it does work, but you need more insulation, right? So if you don't have solar gain, what you need to do, you need to conserve your energy and you, you heat more. So therefore, you need a, more insulation. And yeah, and probably the last windows. I think, I think the principles of Passive House are great. Like right. building, building your home super airtight, you don't have the heat loss that way. Super insulating. To, to achieve the passive house standard, you need, to, you need to meet those certain energy requirements. But the struggle with passive house in Canada is you get the law of diminishing returns when it comes to your insulation costs. Those first six or 10 inches of insulation, you get a lot of payback from that with your heating costs being reduced and your energy savings and you get really good comfort. But then when you have to look at that other five insulation, five inches you need to reach that passive house standard, your, your payback's not not so far. There have been studies and calculations done out there kind of saying you're going to get that first five inches paid back in this many years, but then as you get more and more inches on it, the payback for those extra inches and the cost of those is longer and longer. But I think the, in my opinion, the principles of Passive House, whether you're looking to achieve that full standard or not, are, are very valuable to keep in mind whether you're doing a new build or a renovation. Yeah, so that's true. So the Passive House can be Certified, um, but in order to get certified, all the components has to be have to be passive house certified. So that means the windows have to be yeah certified, the doors and the the HRV, basically all the key components. But again, as Ben said, um, you know the principles are there. Even if you don't want to certify your home, maybe you want to go 
90% passive. Um, so yeah, that's still doable. And, and it will reduce your, your uh, energy use significantly in any event. Who certifies them? Um, there is a few certifier here. Um, uh, probably Tomas, uh, one guy out of Invermere, he just got his certifier uh, certificate. So he would do the certification. Thank you. 